Hi everybody, Kevin here. Hope you're having a great holiday season and eating lots of great food. Um, while I had some downtime, I wanted to get my tutorial on field effectors out there because it's one of my favorite nodes and I've really been looking forward to this one. Um, it lets you do a lot more with particle systems and get this kind of fluid mo motion that you see here. These sort of curls as you know your effectors propagate outwards and not just affect the specific area that it's in. Um, you can get some really cool effects you know, basically allowing you to run simulations as if you were in a liquid rather than just your standard particle system. And I hope this helps you expand your toolkit. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so let's add a particle system to begin with. Um, this should be pretty straightforward by now. So we'll make a particle root, we'll add an emitter, uh, we'll just do a primitive emitter for now. I'm not going to get too crazy with the system. And then a point render. We'll check out some of the other rendering types later. So there's our basic system. I've already loaded this uh, circle texture, which I like to use over the default square. I just think it looks a little nicer. And let's just look at a standard sort of particle system effect for now, like curl noise. Right, so a lot of the built-in effectors in the particle systems are, are actually quite good. And you know they'll let you approach a sort of fluid simulation without much trouble. Um, the big downside that it comes with these uh, effectors in the particle systems, although they're much more performance oriented, is their effect doesn't propagate or stay because the data is only active while this effector is active. There's no um, information for how to pass that on to its neighbors as well as through time. So the moment you turn the effector off, the effect ends and there's not so much of a fluid feel in terms of um, having these particles continue onwards as their motion and eventually dampen to a stop. So let's look at how to make our systems a little bit more fluid and bring in some tools to help us do sort of fluid simulations. And I think a really great way to do that is with fields. Um, if you look at fields in the notch manual, they were basically built to do fluid and ink sort of simulations. The, the one big downside though that most people are familiar with with fields is that they're just very, very heavy to run. And that, that becomes an issue when you try to make really complicated smoke fields and things like that, is they're simply not going to run real time. And if they do, they're not going to run well or aren't going to look uh, high quality or high definition. So my, my, my solution right now for that problem is to use fields to drive your motion, which can be lower resolution, but use a particle system to render out what that motion actually ends up looking like. And I think it's a really effective method because you get the fluid movement, which is really what you're after, but you also get the high quality and performance oriented rendering from particle systems. So I think it's a, a good mix of both worlds until graphics cards can fully render fields at whatever quality you want. And with fields, right, you have to set a sort of voxel um, division. So right now this field is set to be 256 voxels wide by 256 voxels tall and one voxel deep. So it's essentially a flat plane. I believe that's the default. Um, we're going to start with something that runs pretty well uh, for most graphics cards today. And that's 128 by 128 by 128. For me, I think that's a good rule of thumb in terms of where your performance should lie if you're trying to run something real time. Um, if your graphics card isn't quite strong enough to do that, just feel free to bump this down by half, so 64 by 64 by 64. Um, although I only decrease that number by half, you have to remember that this, uh, the amount of voxels you have is essentially width times height times depth. So if you double this number on all three, you're essentially multiplying the number of voxels by eight. So you have to really be careful with how large you make these numbers. In general, I don't think you can run much larger than 256 cubed. Um, before you start hitting sort of performance constraints. So for now, I'm just going to hit this happy medium. Feel free to adjust this how you see fit. And as I do every time, I'm going to, before I even begin, I'm going to lock down my fixed update frame rate just so things are a bit more predictable. I'm going to go 120 today just so it's a little bit slower and you can really see what's happening with the visualization. And I'm going to do the same thing with fields here. So both are locked down to 120. And the, the secret sauce in this whole method is this field effector node. 
So in particles, you have something called the field effector. And you'll notice um, by default that it looks like it'll do something, but it's actually not going to have an effect. And that's because it needs a field input here to this first input on the field effector. And we can go ahead and just field our, or feed our field root in right now. We're going to add some effectors to our field and use that, as I was talking about earlier, to drive the motion. So instead of adding effectors in our particle system, we're going to use the effectors that you find in the fields here instead. And there's much less effectors here than in the particle systems, but some of these um, work in a way that you can't get in particle systems, one of which in particular is this fluid effector. I'm going to add that and not connect it for now, but we'll connect it in a moment. And to visualize how this fluid might behave, let's go ahead and add a turbulence effector for now. And we can kind of do a comparison later with turbulence in particle systems versus a turbulence from a field. So if I connect this, we should immediately start seeing an effect. And already this is quite neat in that it feels really fluid. And if I were to turn this turbulence effector off, you'll notice that the particles keep moving because this field itself actually will pass along this velocity and momentum data to its neighbors. It, it functions like a true fluid rather than this curl noise fluid effector where the moment you turn it off, the effector stops and all motion stops. So this is really interesting and also it's something you really have to watch out for as you start animating is when you turn off effectors in fields, it's not going to turn off movement. Instead, it's going to turn off the source of whatever your effector is and your particles and your system is slowly going to dampen right, and slow down until it stops moving. So you can get very different effects this way. And you'll notice right now these particles are kind of hitting what you could consider the wall, which is your field system. And to get around that, you can just change the scale of your field. Um, you just have to remember that it's still using the same number of voxels. So we've effectively just decreased the resolution of this as we scale it up. And that's okay. But when you're animating a system, just be really conscious that your field effectors are only going to have an effect within this box here that you see. And you'll see again here we're hitting the edge. So you just have to be really conscious of that and mind your scale. You can make this field root huge without issue. Um, just definitely if you run into these sort of situations, check that out. Um, another thing that you can do is if you don't want the particles to stop at this edge, you can change your field effector to a forces mode. And it gives you a very different um, type of behavior in that this velocity and this turbulence is applied as a force. So it'll continue um, onward the, on, onwards with its velocity because these effectors essentially do acceleration rather than velocity. So you can get some very cool effects with that too. I'm going to increase this noise scale just so you can get a little bit more variance in here. And you'll see right away, right, this is, this is a pretty cool sort of fluid effect. And I really like using this technique to get more, um, more dynamic explosions, explosions that don't feel super uniform or constant. And you can get really different kinds of motion in here. So let's also add this fluid effector. I think that this is also a really essential ingredient of our sort of secret sauce here. And just to make this a bit more clear so that we can see what's happening, I'm gonna change this from a sphere to a 3D grid. And I really like that because you can see all these individual lines and kind of what's happening to the shape here as it deforms. I'm gonna make um, this point render have I'm going to increase the number of particles quite a bit, and I'm also going to make them a little bit smaller, just so it's a little finer. Turn off this grid for a moment. So you can see how this grid is sort of deforming with this turbulence effector. And to, like I said, to visualize this fluid effector better, I might use something like a velocity effector instead. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a velocity at our origin here. And I'm going to point it downwards. So that's kind of like gravity, right? And I'm going to really reduce this radius. So it's only affecting a very small area here. So I think a radius of one is a good place to start. I might go 0.5 actually. So this should push essentially your field downwards and it should pull in particles and push them downwards as well. So I'm going to move our um, 3D grid emitter up a little bit. And what should happen is, right, this velocity starts pulling them down. But you can know, you can see right now that it's pretty similar to how um, 
using effectors in particle systems, like that kind of result, doesn't look very fluid. And I find to get a really fluid effect, you generally have to use velocities here because when you apply forces, you, you kind of lose the sort of fluid nature that you're looking for. And the key to this fluid effector in order to get your sort of curls in your fluid dynamics is this vorticity confinement scale. And this is a really fun parameter to play with. Um, I often try exceeding values of one for kicks. Uh, you do have to know that if you go too high with this value, you're going to get some really weird, um, what I consider unstable behavior. So watch out for that. Um, so we have our fluid effector. We have our velocity effector. I'm going to make this a little smaller still. And now we're just sort of pulling down the middle of this grid. I might make it even a little smaller still. So you'll notice like right now, the radius of our velocity effector is nowhere close to our particles up here, but it's still pulling them down because what's happening is this velocity here is affecting these voxels in this field and this field knows to attribute that velocity to its neighbors and create what you can think of as drag or um, kind of fluid friction. And so what's happening is this velocity effector is actually attributing velocity through a radius much wider than you're seeing here and is coming up here and affecting the cube. And as it pulls in areas here, you can see this continues propagating and pulls in elements from other areas of the cube as well. So it's a really cool effect already in that this is something that you would have a much harder time achieving using just particle effectors compared to fluids. Um, to better visualize this, let's add an attribute shading node, also one of my favorite particle nodes. And what we can do with this is we can shade by velocity magnitude. So I'm going to make a color ramp. Um, I think in the demo I showed you earlier, it was kind of like a blue to yellow, like very science-y. Let's do something a little different here. It changes to velocity magnitude. And let's do like a four color ramp. So we'll go from Let's do like a, a purple, perhaps, to a red, and then to an orange, and then finally a yellow. It's very colorful there. And I often have to bump the scale up quite a bit to see an effect. So let's just crank this to like 20. And you can start to see here as the color changes, it's showing you what's happening with the velocity and how the particles are moving. So let me let me increase that even more a little bit so we really get some range in here. I'm gonna move I'm gonna move my velocity, or actually I'll move my grid down slightly, and move my velocity up just slightly so they're a little bit closer. And now you can really see here what this fluid effector is doing. It's basically creating these little swirls that come off to the side. And to better visualize that, you know, let's use a trail render so we can kind of see the path that these particles are taking. So if I connect this trail render here, you can really see now what the motion of the particles are as they move. And I'm gonna turn on sorting here so that they sort properly in depth and also make these lines a little bit thicker there we go. Now you can really see kind of the contrast. I might even go a little bit thicker still. There we go. So now you can really see what's happening on the edges here, right? These little particles are doing this swirl motion because of this fluid effector we added here. Now let's turn this off for a moment and replay this and see what happens. You'll notice that the velocity is very sort of linear, right? And it doesn't um, propagate outwards as much. And this fluid effector basically tells your field to behave like a fluid and send some of these forces outwards away from the source that it is coming from. And as you change the scale, you're going to get a change in the size of these curls. So if I crank this up to four, you'll notice these curls got a little bit larger and more pronounced. And you can keep increasing this value to see what happens. And you're going to get some really cool results. But like I said, you may run into some slight instabilities in your system. And if you run into that sort of scenario, like let me see if I can force it here, just with a really high number. You'll notice that, see stuff starts to kind of move the wrong way and you have these really crazy gusts that get involved here and essentially my system is unstable now.
and how I usually solve these sort of problems is one, don't 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 use such a high value. Um, two, you want to add a little bit of velocity dampening because that's going to prevent any sort of forces from running away and building on itself, and it forces things to kind of slow down and dampen. So you'll get um, slightly more predictable behavior in that the whole system will just have dampening as you would expect in a liquid. Um, you'll have a dampening parameter in your fluid effector here, and you'll also have a velocity dampening parameter in your overall field route. So you can use a combination of those to try to slow certain parts of your system down and help make it more stable um, if you're trying to use really wacky numbers and things like that. So this is our velocity, and this is definitely something that you wouldn't be able to do in a standard particle system, right? Um, we can also look at other effectors like this turbulence effector, which is really fun to play with as well. And you'll get some really wild motion here. Um, you can also change these turbulence effectors so that instead of random directions, they, they are directional. And what's really cool about doing that is if I make it orient downwards as well, like our velocity, Right now, it's going to affect pretty much everywhere, but you can change this noise threshold, which basically tells it your noise must surpass a certain threshold to have an effect. And you'll get some really cool results where certain areas won't have any forces on them, and the other areas will have forces on them, so that you get a really varied um, sort of drip or fluid flow. It, it kind of simulates having different densities in different areas of your field. So you can get some really cool effects that way too. And you can play with this noise scale to change um, basically the size of that noise function and where it has and doesn't have an effect. And you can get some really different looks that way, as well as this noise threshold. So you see like everything is moving because our noise is uh, scaled so small or large that um, your spans are really large, so if we increase this number to say 10, you're going to get really small pockets of movement rather than a large overall movement. So depending on the style of look you're going for, you can really hone in some interesting looks here. Right, so that looks pretty nice. The trails is a bit much. I'm going to switch that off and just look at our points here for a moment. So this is looking really nice. You can even increase your particle count far higher. Um, because again, your, your system is going to handle particles much better than it can handle any sort of field rendering. So I, I've pushed this number up quite high before to like 250,000 even, and it runs decently smoothly, smoothly for how many particles it is. Like, let, let's try it out real quick. So there's 250,000 particles. You know, my system's still running at 60 FPS. So this is definitely something that you could reasonably be reasonably run real time on most systems. I mean, I'm on a 1070 right now. So you could push that even farther with other types of graphics cards. So, you know, with our point render, I'm going to give it a little bit of size randomness. And then I'm at type 0.8. And I'm also going to scale them down slightly over time so they kind of fall off and disappear. And I might make them just a little bit larger, like that. There you go, so we're getting some really cool results now. Right, like let's add a, I mean that, that's basically it, that, that's field effectors. You can play with all sorts of the, the field effector um, types to see what happens and how that can you know, impact your scene. Right, if I compare what, what our turbulence effector is right now to a standard particle system turbulence effector, like if I match the settings here real quick, I did 5 and 0.8 with the directional velocity. Okay, so those settings between these turbulence effectors are pretty much the same, or whatever I can control there. And so if I turn off this field effector, you'll see right away that the motion of these particles is very different because they're very linear, and the moment you turn this off, they're going to stop. And that's it. So it's very like robotic in a way. So to get that fluid effect, right, we use this turbulence effector in our fluid, and you get a much more sort of organic, natural behavior. And what's great is when you turn this turbulence effector off, the system will keep running. Right, right now it's off, and the system will keep going, it'll dampen, and eventually it'll slow down and stop. So you can get much more sort of organic transitions to using um, field systems rather than your standard particle effectors. So you def definitely want to watch performance and, again, the sizing of your field 
simulation area. But if you watch both those things, you can do some really, really cool effects. And as I was doing earlier, we can add a camera as well. And if we pull that back slightly, um, one effect that I think is actually I'm going to put in a null. Uh, one effect that I think is really nice is using some depth of field. And uh, the thing with particle systems, particle systems and depth of field is it doesn't work the same way with shapes. So normally you kind of add a, um, I'm going to make this spin, but normally you add a depth of field node here to your camera and that's what creates your depth of field. But that, that doesn't work with particles. It doesn't do anything. So how you actually do depth of field with particles is you do it in your point renderer here. Your point renderer itself has a depth of field amount here. And so if you turn that up to some reasonable amount here, I wouldn't go all the way, it'll actually use your focal plane distance and focal range that you have here in your camera. So you'll see right away, we're getting some really cool depth of field effect here. And as I move this focal plane distance, we can kind of scan through um, our particle system. So you can use this to get some really cool, uh, like convincing 3D with your simulations. And if I make our camera spin around our scene here, um, let's do a speed of oh, 15. That's pretty good. And then I might widen our lens angle a little bit here and make our camera a little closer. So we're a distance of four units away. So we can set our focal plane distance to also be four so it focuses on the center. And then we can decrease our range to get that kind of nice like shallow depth of field sort of bokeh effect. And right away, we kind of achieved what I showed you initially. And you get this really nice depth of field here. Um, one thing to know with depth of field is it doesn't work with trail renders. They don't have the same parameter. You would have to use um, extruded geometry in your standard depth of field method for that, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, and similarly, I haven't had great luck with depth of field and line connection render. So if you plan on using depth of field in your scene, you're probably going to have to stick to this point render, or you're going to have to push your number of particles way down so that you can use the extruded geometry render in your trails. Um, but I think I'm going to end it there. I hope this was really helpful. Um, as you can see here, we used fluid effectors to get some really, really cool dynamic um, sort of simulation effects out of our fluid. And we use different types of renders to help us visualize what is happening there. So I think um, if this interests you, you should go and play with some of the other uh, fluid and field effectors that you have access to. Play with the settings, see what you get. Um, I think this is something that you can use really, really heavily in a lot of VFX and shows and things like that to get something that's a little bit different than your standard particle system. So uh, have fun. Can't wait to see what you guys make. Until next time, and I'll see you in the new year in 2019. Cheers.